Okay, so let's talk about genomes and DNA replication here. And let me just double check. Yep, we are going. Sweet. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about DNA replication. And you guys may have heard these terms before, leading versus lagging strands. It's one of the ways we get around some of the weirdness that happens in DNA replication. And then we're going to hap uh, talk about what happens when we get to the end of our DNA molecules. That's also a, a bit of an issue as well. It's called the end replication problem. We'll look at mutations and how we repair them. And then finally, we'll round out our lecture by talking about different types of genomes that cells have and what a genome is. All right. So just a quick review, uh, you guys have probably heard this before, the central dogma of molecular biology. A dogma is a very deeply held belief. So this central dogma says that everything that a cell ultimately becomes, which you know most of a cell is protein, derives ultimately from DNA. And we turn our DNA into RNA, and that process of turning DNA into RNA is called transcription. And then we turn RNA into protein. That process is called translation. However, we're not looking at either one of those today. We are looking at replication, how we make more DNA. So this is going to touch off our next major series of topics, which is all about DNA, all about transcription, all about translation, and regulating these processes. Oh. <laughs> and then I have a little, little note here. So sometimes, you can have reverse transcription where you can take RNA and revert it back into DNA. Our cells, as far as we know, don't really do that naturally, but some viruses are capable of doing that. In fact, some viruses, for some viruses, their genome is actually based on RNA, and they have to reverse transcribe their RNA into DNA during the process of infecting us. And these viruses that do that, they're actually known as retroviruses retro, not because they're from the 70s, but because they do reverse retro transcription. All right, so let's put this in some context. When do we do DNA replication? When do we do this process? Keep in mind that the cell's life is divided into several stages. The first stage is called G1, the second stage is called S, the third stage is called G2, and the fourth stage is called M. G stands for growth. So both G1 and G2 stands for, stand for growth. S stands for synthesis, because you're synthesizing or making more DNA. M stands for mitosis. Together, G1, S, and G2 are collectively known as interphase. And most cells are actually not in G1S or G2. Most cells have exited this active cellular growth, and they've gone into a sort of not quite hibernation state, but um, just what we call a quiescent state. So quiescent. Quiescent means no longer actively growing. Not dead, not alive. Oh, wrong terminology, but not dead, not actually growing. So if you're a quiescent cell, you would not be doing DNA replication. All right, but that's stuff that hopefully we've, we saw in Bio 160. Let's take a look at, some, at the DNA inside the nucleus. And we are also somewhat familiar with this too. Remember, this is what our cell nucleus looks like most of the cell's life. This is what the cell nucleus like, looks like during interphase in particular, during that G1, S, and G2 phase. Yes, and this is what it looks like even as you're replicating the DNA. And we call this state of DNA decondensed. So we say DNA decondenses during interphase. It's all spread out. You can easily read any, any genes on, the, on those DNA molecules. Now when that DNA starts to condense, starts to pack tightly together, that's when we see the individual chromosomes right here. And that really only happens as you approach M phase and during M phase. And it kind of makes sense. You'll, you'll hear me use this analogy again later. Uh, when you're moving, right, when you're, when you're moving from one house to another, you don't, when, when you 
move all your stuff. You don't pick up one fork and then move it over to the new place and then put it down, right? That would be horribly inefficient, not to mention you would break a lot of things. Cells work kind of the same way, right? They don't move, you know, one gene, one strand of DNA at a time. What they do is they pack everything up, just like you would pack your stuff into boxes and move it in big chunks. So those big chunks are what we see here, and that's actually a single line of DNA, right? That's originally was decondensed like this, but then was compacted and compacted and compacted into a visible chromosome. Now if we did some fancy Photoshop on those chromosomes, we could line them up in pairs and we could say, oh, we have two copies of the DNA, long DNA strand known as chromosome 1, two copies of a long DNA strand known as chromosome 2, two copies of 3, etc. So a closer look at what's happening here. This is our DNA before we make a copy of it. So there's only one strand here. And we have a special, we have a couple special sequences in here. Uh, the only special sequence that we are going to worry about in this lecture is actually the telomeres here at the end. So we have a telomere at either end. We're not going to worry about the centromeres quite yet. Now the other sequence that we are going to worry about is the replication origin. It's also just known as the origin of replication. And these are the areas in yellow right here. And you'll notice that during S phase, this would be G1, this would be S, this would be G2 probably. During S phase we open up at those origins of replication and that's where we start making new DNA or start matching up new DNA. We call the original strand that we see in the G1 phase, we call this original strand. Now let me make this a little neater here. We call this original strand the parent strand. And we call the strand that we manufactured during S phase the daughter strand. There's a lot of female pronouns that we use here when we talk about DNA and chromosomes. Sister, chromatids, daughter strand, all those daughter cells. And then after you've made a copy of that strand of DNA, the two copies are hooked together at the central specialized region of DNA known as the centromere. We're going to come back to that when we talk about mitosis. Here's a mitotic chromosome right here. This guy is highly compacted, so we don't, that's why he looks more dense, a little fatter. And then during mitosis, we separate our two copies of the genome into two separate daughter cells. So here we have one copy and another copy existing in two separate daughter cells. So we go from one copy to two copies during S phase, and from two copies back to one copy in each cell during M phase. So it's a big old cycle, which is why it's called the cell cycle. Okay, so what actually happens in these little areas right here where we're laying down daughter strand? Well, here's a schematic, all right? Here's the parent molecule. What we do with the parent molecules, we break the hydrogen bonds between the nitrogenous bases. And remember, T and A has two hydrogen bonds, G and C has three, so T and A is a little bit easier to break. And then, once we've unzipped those strands, we literally call it unzipping, once those strands have been unzipped, we will match up daughter nucleotides, here they're shown in, in light blue, so daughter nucleotides. daughter nucleotides in light blue. And we know which nucleotides to match up because of complementary base pairing, right? If there's an A on the parent, there has to be a T on the daughter. If there's a C on the parent, there has to be a G on the daughter, etc. Now this process is called semi-conservative replication. Semi-conservative. This is in contrast to other types of replication that we thought may have also existed before we worked out this mechanism. Um, we also thought that Maybe there could be fully conservative replication, there could be what's called dispersive replication, 
but as it turns out, DNA replication is semi-conservative. Semi-conservative means half old. So semi, halfway, conservative. Well, to conserve means to maintain or to keep, or you can just think of the white old guys in the Republican Party. I shouldn't say that. That would probably get me in trouble. All right. So each molecule of DNA is half new, half old. Now, when we actually add on those, that, those daughter nucleotides, we have to do it in a very specific way. So keep in mind, so a little bit of background information here before, before we actually start getting into the meat of this subject. Um, when we create the daughter strand, we are creating it nucleotide by nucleotide by nucleotide, and we're doing it via dehydration reactions. Um, now, where do we get these nucleotides in order to create our daughter strand? They exist as what are called DNTPs, deoxyribo, uh, deoxyribonucleotide triphosphates, and they're floating around the nucleus. Your cell constantly manufactures a new supply of these DNTPs uh, as soon as it begins to enter S phase. So we've got DATP, DTTP, DCTP, DGTP, right? And remember, they're ATP. UTP, although UTP is converted into TTP ultimately. Uh, CTP and GTP are used in RNA because they lack that D denoting deoxyribose. Now remember those D and TPs have three phosphate groups and what we have to do is we have to remove two of those phosphate groups. We have to remove two of those phosphate groups and hydrolyze those D and TPs down to DNMPs deoxyribonucleotide monophosphates with one phosphate group, so we're removing two. We do that as we add these nucleotides into the daughter strand. Now where we actually make the vast majority of our DNTPs is in the liver in humans. We, um, we export them to other cells. Our other cells are totally capable of making their own DNTPs. It just takes a lot of time and effort, and so we would really like to specialize in where we make our DNTPs. And of course, we also have to break down any DNTPs we do not use. And something that's very interesting about nucleotide breakdown is it can lead to some really unusual diseases. So gout is actually one of them. Gout is where you improperly uh, catabolize or improperly break down. Catabolize and break down are uh, the same thing. It's, gout is where you improperly catabolize uracil, actually. When you improperly break down uracil, uh, you, it forms crystals. So it forms uracil crystals. And these little crystals are sharp. They hurt. And they tend to accumulate in joints. Now, for some reason, the joint that is most vulnerable to accumulation of these uracil crystals is actually the big toe. So you get pain in your big toe if you have gout. Another far less common but really, really amazing um, side effect of improper catabolism of DNTPs is actually something called Lesch-Nyhan syndrome. This is also caused by improper catabolism of uracil, but uh, in, in a there, there's a enzyme in the in the pathway that breaks it down differently in Lesch Nyhan than it does in gout. And with Lesch Nyhan, um, for reasons that we are we're not quite sure why, uh, because these individuals cannot properly break down uracil, it accumulates in their probably in and around their neurons and it radically changes their behavior and their personality. Actually I should say probably just personality. It makes them extreme self harmers. So they will gouge their skin, they will rip off their, the skin of their lips, they'll gouge out their own eyeballs if they get the chance. And all this is caused by uh, improper breakdown of uracil. So here's how we add on those DNTPs. Here we have a DNTP down here onto a daughter strand. Here's the parent strand. Here's the daughter strand on our left. And we are adding on to a pre-existing daughter strand. We're not going to talk about how we make a new one. We're adding on to a pre-existing daughter strand. 
and we're bringing in a DNTP. It actually turns out to be a G D G T P because look, we have a G for the nitrogenous base. There are three phosphate groups. We're going to rip off two of those phosphate groups, and we're going to take the remaining phosphate group and attach an H from the phosphate group, there's an H hanging off here, I promise, to the OH on the deoxyribose of the daughter strand. So we attach an H to an OH, H and an OH, and that gives us H2O. So this is a condensation or dehydration reaction when we do this. And when we do this, we create a special covalent bond called a phosphodiester bond. And it's here, it's, you can barely see it, but it's there, phosphodiester bond. By ripping off these two phosphate groups, by the way, that gives us energy. You know, most of the time, whenever you do these sorts of reactions, when you're building molecules, it takes, you have to put energy in, right? Well, in this case, this is sort of a self-powering reaction. These DNTPs are not only their own source of energy using the two phosphate groups, they are also what ultimately becomes the molecule. So it's kind of kind of cool, very efficient here. Now those two phosphate groups that we rip off, they will go float away and they're actually going to be reused to make more DNTPs down the line. So the energy used to hydrolyze the phosphate groups is actually used to create that phosphodiester bond. And then we repeat the process by bringing in another DNTP and latching on to the 3' prime OH or the 3' prime hydroxyl of the next nucleotide of that former DGTP, now DGMP. Hey, so how do we start this process of replication then? We're not going to get into the chemical de details, but we'll look at some of the, the big picture, the macro structure. Come on. So first things first, a replication bubble forms. That's our first step. And where that replication bubble forms is at that specific area of DNA called the origin of replication. And let me show you. Going back right here, let me erase some of this. Here's our replication origin or origin of replication. It's a specific DNA sequence, could be a, uh, several nucleotides along. And here's the replication bubble that we are forming. The replication bubble part makes sense now, doesn't it? Okay. So what happens is, as soon as we open up that replication bubble, I'm going to draw a replication bubble down below. We lay down daughter strand. I drew the parent strand in blue, and I would draw the daughter strand in red. We lay down daughter strand, and that replication bubble is going to move outwards in either direction. So it's going to move outwards and move outwards until eventually it reaches the end of the DNA molecule, right here on either end. So we call that bidirectional replication, bi means two. With bacteria, it's pretty easy what happens. Let me show you what it looks like in bacteria. Bacteria have usually have circular chromosomes. So they open up one replication bubble. They have one origin of replication. That replication bubble proceeds around the ring in either direction, and they meet together at the top. What happens there, nobody knows. So, you know, go get a PhD, spend 10 years of your life studying this, and report back to us. This over here, by the way, is a, um, is a uh, scanning electron micrograph of a little replication bubble. That's a real piece of DNA right there. Down here, eukaryotes are a little more complicated. So eukaryotes have multiple origins of replication, simply because our DNA is so much longer than prokaryotes, the most prokaryotes anyways. So with us, if we just started at one end, open up a replication bubble at one end, say over here, and went all the way to the other end, it would take us about a month to replicate our DNA. Obviously when you look at skin cells, they have a turnover about every six days, right? They have to divide about every six days. That is not going to cut it. 
So what we do is we, ulti is we open up multiple bubbles. We open up multiple bubbles, multiple origins of replication. And hold on just a sec, guys. All right, guys, sorry about that. One of my co coworkers offered me M&Ms, and of course I had to take her up on it. Where were we? Oh, yeah. We were talking about replication bubbles and why eukaryotes have multiple replication bubbles and therefore multiple origins of replication. Uh, we have to open up multiple replication bubbles along a single strand of DNA in order to just speed up the entire process. And for each replication bubble, it'll proceed outwards in either direction until somewhere in the middle they meet. And again, what, ex what happens there exactly? We don't really know. Now there's, there's a special problem though for when we get to the very end of the DNA molecule right here and right here, that's the end replication problem that we talked about. And we're going to come back to that, that end replication problem. Okay, so first things first, how do we actually start opening up that DNA molecule? Uh, let me draw this out. Actually, I know I have a blank slide here somewhere. There we go. So I'm going to draw out a DNA molecule with the replication bubble already partially opened. All right, so parent strand is in red and daughter strand in this case is now going to be in blue. And we're going to zoom in on one part of that replication bubble right here. That part where the two parent strands uh, diverge, that's called the replication fork. So we're going to look at the replication fork area. Let me draw that a little bit bigger now. So here's our replication fork. In order to start opening up the two strands of DNA, the two parent strands of DNA, we have to break the hydrogen bonds in between the nitrogenous bases. And we have an enzyme that does this specialized enzyme that breaks those hydrogen bonds. I'm drawing that enzyme here in green. He actually kind of looks like a flower. And that enzyme's name is helicase. Helicase. So helicase, he's moving to the left in this image and he's unzipping the parent strand by breaking the hydrogen bonds uh, between those nitrogenous bases. Have you guys ever heard the joke, if I were helicase, I would unzip your genes. <laughs> hey, I thought it was pretty funny, okay? So, again, helicase unzips DNA by breaking the hydrogen bonds. Once we have single-stranded DNA now that's just open and exposed and waving around, we need to protect it. So we have additional proteins called single-stranded binding proteins. <laughs> they do what they, say, what they say on the box, all right? They attach to the single strands and prevent them from reattaching. And in biology, the technical term for DNA reattaching to itself is called re-annealing. So to anneal means to attach. So all along, let me go back to my blank drawing here. All along this single-stranded area on the parent strand, we have single-stranded binding proteins. So let me draw those in. Draw those in in orange. So, SSBPs, and they're on both sides. I just got lazy and I drew them on one side. Now, something interesting happens with helicase, though. Imagine that, you know, you're taking a shoelace that's really, really tightly twisted up. I don't know if you ever did this as a kid, but you take one of your shoelaces out and you really, really tightly twist it up almost until it's coiling on itself and then you straighten out part of the bottom, the top becomes super twisted, doesn't it? It's a similar thing that happens with telephone cords, you know those old style telephone cords, the twisted ones? If you try and untwist the bottom of the telephone cord, the top becomes super twisted. So with telephone cords and shoestrings, this is not a big deal, right? They, they're pretty tough, they're not really gonna break. But with DNA, DNA is pretty delicate. So if you twist the top too much, it'll actually break. So this torsion tension 
created by helicase has to be relieved. And so we have one other enzyme that helps with opening up DNA, and that enzyme's name is topoisomerase. So topo means surface, just like topology, right? The study of the surface of things. An isomer means, in, in chemistry, means that a molecule has the same form, or, sorry, same components, same number and types of atoms, but a different structure. So a topoisomerase just changes the surface of a molecule. And what it actually does is it cuts that DNA, holds it in a really nice safe place, and allows that DNA to rewind, or rather to unwind, to relieve some of that te tension, then reattaches the DNA together. So in our picture, let's go add the topoisomerase. Okay, and topoisomerase usually works uphill, so a little bit ahead of the DNA helicase. I'm going to draw him here in blue. He looks like a blue, like what, you know those old style car wash sponges? Draw in topoisomerase here. Okay. Now, also something interesting, um, if topoisomerase isn't active, then DNA will keep twisting and twisting and twisting and twisting until it just breaks. Not so good for the cell, right? But we do have drugs that inhibit topoisomerase. Um, Arenotecan is one such, such drug. Topotecan is another. These are actually used as chemotherapy drugs. And uh, they only work on cells that are using topoisomerase, the cells that need to make a lot of DNA, the cells that are dividing rapidly, cancerous cells, right? So arenotecan and topotecan are actually both pretty potent chemotherapies, and they work by inhibiting topoisomerase. Okay, so we've opened our DNA. Now let's start laying down daughter nucleotides in the daughter strand. One thing to keep in mind with DNA, and this is kind of a a weird rule. DNA can only be read by enzymes in one direction, the three prime to five prime direction. Remember those little apostrophes mean prime. So if we go back, jumping back here, all the way back, here's our five prime end, here's our three prime end on our daughter strand, on our parent strand, here's our three three prime end up top, our five prime end on the bottom. When we are reading our parent strand, we have to read the nucleotides from three prime to five prime. Ignore the tan arrow in the background, that's just stylistic, okay? So when our enzymes are reading the parent strand, they're reading A first, oops. It would help if I did not change my slide all of a sudden. So they're reading A first, then T, then C third. All right. So we read three to five, but when we add on daughter nucleotides, notice five prime up here, three prime at the bottom, we're adding from five to three, five down to three, and we're adding on to the three prime end of the daughter strand where that OH is. That three prime OH, as it turns out, is super important. Because at that 3 prime OH, that's where we attach the hydrogen from our phosphate group, dang it, the hydrogen from our phosphate group to the hydroxyl of our, of our uh, deoxyribose, and that's where we take out water and do our, our dehydration reaction. So the only option we have for adding on new nucleotides is on that 3 prime end. So our parent strand is red, 3 to 5 to see what nitrogenous bases are there. Our daughter strand is written or made five to three, and that's because we need to add on to that three prime hydroxyl hanging off the edge. There's no five prime hydroxyl. Now the enzyme that does this, that does the reading and the writing, that's DNA polymerase three. I know you're looking at three going, oh my gosh, who named this? They were named in the order of their discovery. So DNA polymerase 3 was discovered 
third, as you might imagine. So DNA polymerase 3 is the one that reads the parent 3 to 5 and writes the daughter 5 to 3. Now because you can only read DNA in one direction and write DNA in one direction, does that mean that only one half of that parent DNA can be read? And of course we know the answer is no. Right? There is a workaround. So again, just to emphasize this, here is a nitrogenous base, here is the 5 carbon sugar, our three phosphate groups. All together, this is our DNTP, and we have the three prime hydroxyl hanging off the edge here. Our parent strand is read from top to bottom on this image, three prime to five prime. Come on, there we go. So C, G, or T, G, C, A, in that order, from top to bottom. And then our daughter strand is made from the five prime end down to the three prime end. And we're adding on to the three prime hydroxyl, right there, taking off these two phosphate groups. And it's DNA polymerase that does this. So, let's go back to our image here, and I'm going to actually erase my single-stranded binding proteins to make this a little bit easier on the eyes, so to speak. Oop, and I can also erase my parent strand too. Let's redraw that parent strand. There we go. Beautiful parent strand. So, because we, our parent strand has to be red, 3 prime to 5 prime. I'm going to put 3 over here and 5 over here. So 3 prime on the right, 5 prime on the left because my helicase is going to the left. That means that on the other side, and if you guys are listening to this in the car or something like that, uh, make sure you're, you watch this at home. Okay, the image is important here. On the other side I put a 3 prime and then a 5 prime. So far, so good. We know DNA is anti-parallel, so where there's not a 3, there's a 5. Okay. So let's lay down our daughter strand here. All right. So let's pick a color. Let's do purple for our daughter strand. So we're going to start our daughter strand at the 3 prime of the parent. And we're going to lay down our daughter strand, matching up complementary nucleotides to what's on the parent strand. So on our daughter strand, we should have 5 prime here and 3 prime here. We are adding on to the 3 prime end. That is awesome. It follows our rules, so we're good to go. Now we can do this all smoothly in one continuous motion using DNA polymerase. Let me actually draw on DNA polymerase right there. DNA just going to shorten to Paul for polymerase, DNA polymerase 3. This is all one smooth, continuous daughter strand for the most part. We'll talk about an exception in just a sec. And because of this, we call this the continuous strand. It also has another name. It's called the leading strand. The continuous or leading strand. Now on the other side, if we tried to add in a daughter strand here, we would be adding on to the 5 prime end, and that doesn't follow our rules. We can't do that. Instead, what we have to do, we have to break it up into little chunks. And those little chunks, well, they're, they're chunky, right? So we call the opposite strand the discontinuous strand, also known as the lagging strand. Okay, so the two parent, the two halves of the parent molecule are split into a leading strand and the lagging strand. The leading strand, pretty easy. We read it 3 to 5. We lay down complement, complementary nucleotides 5 to 3. So we see that the leading strand is continuous or it's synthesized continuously. The lagging strand, we have to break up into little chunks in order to follow our 3 to 5 reading rule. So our lagging strand is synthesized in chunks. We call it discontinuous or it is synthesized discontinuously. So let's take a look at our lagging strand then. And actually, I'm going to um, 
draw it on here first, and then we'll look at our next slide. So I'm going to erase some labels, clean it up a little bit. So in our lagging strand, actually I'm going to keep it purple, what we have to do is we have to lay down a little chunk of DNA, and it's going to go in the opposite direction of our replication fork. So it's going to go in the opposite direction of our helicase and topoisomerase and all those. Notice though, when I do go in that opposite direction, I'm going towards my three prime end. So I'm following my rules, aren't I? And then I'm going to hop backwards and lay down another chunk of DNA that seems to be going in the opposite direction, but again, I'm adding on to the three prime end, so I'm okay. I'm going to go backwards and lay down another chunk of DNA, adding on to the three prime end. I'm okay here. All right? So these little chunks right here are the reason why it's called the discontinuous or lagging strand. So you have to do these short little backwards hops, laying down this one first, this one first, second, this one second, and this one third. So these short, uh, in order to make the lagging strand, you have to do these short, weird little backwards stitches here. And that's all to get around that rule of reading three to five and writing five to three. Now those chunks, those separate chunks, we have a name for them. Of course, we have a name for frickin' everything, right? They are called Okazaki fragments. They are called Okazaki fragments. Named after a Japanese dude whose last name was Okazaki. Okay, so that's what this slide shows right here. This is actually um, a little bit more accurate. Up top, or sorry, on the bottom, this is our leading strand. On top, this is our lagging strand. And you can see with our leading strand, as we're opening up our replication fork, there's an invisible helicase and topoisomerase working here. Let me actually draw them in. Or I could do that and totally exit out of the PowerPoint. There we go. So here's our helicase, our green flower. Here's our topoisomerase, our blue car wash sponge. Let me label leading and lagging strand. Leading on the bottom and lagging on the top. All right. So notice our leading strand, we start over here and we just do one smooth continuous chunk. All right. So we, where we start, when I say we start over here, we started at the origin of replication. On the lagging strand, on the other hand, we have to do these little individual chunks. Here's one chunk. Here's another chunk. We're only showing two here. And then before we move on, before we unzip some more using helicase and topoisomerase, we're going to have to replace, we're going to have to repair that gap between the two junks, the two junks, the two chunks, and also clean up some of the leftover bits, the pink tags that we see here. So that's why down here we still only see two fragments, because this one, this fragment right here, has already been cleaned up. Now you may be wondering, what are those pink tags? So this is where we really start to hate DNA polymerase. He's, he's being a butthead. All right. So DNA polymerase, not only will he only read and write in one direction, he can only attach on to DNA if it's double-stranded. So going back, oop, all the way back, come on, let's go, let's go. There we go. Going all the way back, when we first open up our bubble right there, we have to attach to that, to essentially nothing, to just single-stranded DNA right there. Right? Well, DNA polymerase can't do that. He's, he's a picky jerk. So he has to have pre-existing double-stranded nucleotides 
already sitting there waiting for him before he will deign to drag his butt over there and attach. This really pisses me off, you can tell, right? So what we have to do is we have to lay down a little bit of nucleotide to make just a, a tiny bit of that single-stranded DNA double-stranded in order for DNA polymerase to attach. So let me modify this drawing now. We have to lay down a little bit of nucleotide in order, for, in order to get DNA polymerase to attach, and we have to do that every single time he's going to try and reattach to DNA. That little bit of single-stranded nucleotide, we call that a primer. And as it turns out, it's, that primer is not made of DNA, it's actually made of RNA. And you're kind of going, well, why in the world would we make it of RNA when we're doing DNA replication? There's a good reason for it, I promise. We will cover it later on. When I say later on, I mean like later on in this lecture, so you don't have to wait too long. Okay, so these little pink tags right here that we see, those are actually our RNA primers. Okay. Now, uh, this, this goes through what we just saw in our drawing. This says, this is comparing the leading strand, this next slide, with the lagging strand. All right. Um, the only thing new here is that information about the RNA primer. Again, DNA polymerase needs an RNA primer laid down to start both the leading and any of the Okazaki fragments on the lagging strand. Now, once on the leading strand, once he does attach the RNA primer, he will just keep going, tag teaming along behind Heligase and Topoisomerase until another replication bubble coming the opposite direction, uh, until he meets up with that other replication bubble. Okay, this image is from your textbook, just a different way of looking at things. This shows all the individual enzymes a little bit more clearly, so we can see topoisomerase right there. We can see helicase right here. He's slightly misplaced, but you know he's there. I told you he kind of looks like a demented flower. Here's our single-stranded binding proteins right there. They look like peeps to me, like dark blue peeps. You know, the candy. And then here's the enzyme that makes our primer. You can barely see it in yellow right there. The enzyme is called a primase, go figure, although not something you need to know. Once that RNA primer is laid down, DNA polymerase will attach and synthesize. And notice he's going, he's writing 5 prime, this would be 3 prime over here. So that follows our rule on the leading strand. So leading strand is up top in this image, lagging strand is on the bottom. Okay, here's our lagging strand. Again, every time we want DNA polymerase to attach, we have to have those little RNA primers. And the name of the enzyme that lays down those RNA primers is just primase. Sometimes you can even get fancy and call it RNA primase. And every chunk, every DNA uh, chunk plus that little RNA primer on the lagging strand, that's an Okazaki fragment. And the whole point of this Okazaki fragment stuff is just to get around that, that really awkward anti-parallel structure of DNA and DNA polymerase's three, DNA polymerase three's awful temper. Okay, well, I apparently meant to draw something here. There, I drew something. Okay, so here's what our lagging strand looks like. Again, another view. The leading strand is now grayed out. We're focusing on the lagging. Here's topoisomerase, helicase, some of our peeps, our single-stranded binding proteins. Here we're creating an RNA primer that DNA polymerase can attach to and synthesize in this way. And then we're going to create a second RNA primer a couple of microseconds later. DNA polymerase is, is going to attach to that and synthesize that way, create a second Okazaki fragment. 
And then we're going to create a third RNA primer over here. DNA polymerase is going to attach to that and synthesize forwards. In the meantime, we're going to chew out those RNA primers that are there. We don't want RNA in our DNA, right? We're going to remove those RNA primers and we're going to seal that phosphodiester backbone while we're continuing to move along our replication fork. So all of this is happening simultaneously. We will also remove the RNA primer and seal together the backbone on the lagging strand, but we only need to do it once because we only have one primer on the lagging strand. Okay, so the enzyme that actually removes the primers is another DNA polymerase. That's DNA polymerase 1. So we've got DNA polymerase 3, the main one. We've got DNA polymerase 1. What happened to DNA polymerase 2? Well, DNA polymerase 2, as it turns out, is involved in DNA repair, as we shall see. Oh, come on. Okay, so don't worry about him yet. Now when DNA polymerase 1 replaces those RNA primers with DNA, he doesn't do a perfect job, right? He's like his cousin. He's kind of lazy. So he leaves a small gap in the phosphodiester backbone that has to be sealed. It has to be connected. We have to make a single covalent bond there. I don't know if you can see it in these images. Uh, kind of, right there. All right, so there's the gap left over. We have to bring in one final enzyme to seal that gap. And that enzyme's name is DNA ligase. To ligate means to join together in regular everyday English. So DNA ligase is an enzyme that joins DNA together. Now what's interesting about DNA ligase is not only is he active when, um, when you're doing DNA replication, he's also active whenever you make any sort of break in the backbone of DNA, because he's the one that repairs those breaks. And when you make a lot of breaks is actually when you walk out into sunlight. So UV light will create lots of, of gaps, lots of breaks in the DNA backbone, and it's DNA ligase that will seal those gaps. If you have a defective DNA ligase, not only do you have trouble doing DNA replication and finishing replication, it's, it's not impossible for you, but it's troublesome, but you also have to stay out of the sunlight because sunlight essentially gives you a huge, awful, terrible sunburn, the likes of which you cannot imagine. And it gives you that sunburn because you don't have a mechanism to repair your DNA, and your cells, as a result, just, just die due to damage from that UV light. That's what a sunburn is. It's cell death. So we actually think that people with this disorder, it has a name, you don't have to know this. Xeroderma pigmentosum is the name of the disorder. We actually think that people with this disorder were, may have been the origin of the vampire myth. You can't go in the sun. I don't know what garlic and silver steaks and all that have to do with it, but somehow that came along. So altogether, all these enzymes involved in replicating DNA, they can be collectively referred to as the replosome. The replosome is all of these enzymes, DNA polymerases 1 and 3, top isomerase, helicase, ligase, our RNA primase as well, and also these single-stranded binding proteins. Oops. So RNA primase as well, and also these single-stranded binding proteins. So this is what this all looks like. Here's our topoisomerase. Here's our primase hanging on in there. Here's our helicase. Here's our DNA polymerases. And here's our DNA ligase. And there's our PEEPs, our single-stranded binding proteins. And give me just a sec. Oh, we're good. Somebody was being very loud. So all together, all of these are referred to as the replosome. And you'll see here, this is actually the lagging strand that I'm outlining right here. This is the leading strand. Let me do it in a different color. Lagging strand and leading strand. 
The image that I, picked, that I depicted before showing the lagging strand is straight out is not quite accurate. The lagging strand actually is looped out like this in reality, but it's a lot harder to see what's going on with all of the enzymes when it's in this loop. So in textbooks and on drawings, we, send, we tend to draw it as straight out the way I did before. So, to end this, why do we use primers made of RNA? Right? Why don't we just use DNA primers to get the whole process going? That way we don't have to worry about removing them. So, this is actually from a, my graduate school textbook. I was, this, this question was bugging me like crazy. Um, so I went and I found the answer. And this is a quote from the, from the text. Um, an enzyme such as RNA primase that starts chains anew, so it starts DNA chains from single-stranded DNA, cannot be efficient at self-correction. Even if the copies retained in the final product, so at the very, very end when, you're create, when, when you've created your final DNA, so even if the copies retained in the final product constituted as little as 5% of the total genome, the resulting increase in the overall mutation rate would be enormous. and therefore seems likely that the use of RNA rather than DNA for priming brings a powerful advantage to the cell. The ribonucleotides in the primer automatically mark these sequences as suspect copy to be efficiently removed and replaced. So there you go. That's our current best explanation. RNA primase um, cannot repair its, its, its own work, whereas, as it turns out, as we'll learn, DNA polymerase can. So this is just a cool image. I got this from um, an instructor over at University of Washington who teaches virology. He's like a PowerPoint wizard. I love his PowerPoints. And this shows our leading strand on, on top and the lagging strand on the bottom. And we can see just at the beginning of a replication bubble, this is a RNA primer along with this. Here's that replication bubble moving forward one step. Here we see one Okazaki fragment, a second Okazaki fragment, fragment, and the formation of a third. Here it is going forward again, and again, again, and there we go. At the end, notice we have an RNA primer left over. We're going to remove him, but there's no single-stranded bit of DNA over here for our DNA polymerase to synthesize inwards. So we're stuck right here at the very, very end of our DNA strands at the ends of our chromosomes with a little bit left over that we cannot replicate. And this single-stranded bit on this other side, this is just broken off. It's unstable. We break it off and we recycle it. Our cell reuses it. So that is called the end replication problem right there, is figuring out what to do about this little piece right here that we can't replicate. All right, I'm going to call this the end of part one. And later on, we shall see part two.